fortune though that I have two of these two of the most talented writers in the country who really need no introduction. So would you please welcome Hugo Hamilton. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read from a new book called Hand on the Fire. Um, as, as a lot of you might know already, I, I come from a mixed background. My mother was German, my father was Irish. So I'm very curious about the whole business of immigration and you know, people migrating from different places to Ireland and from Ireland. Sometimes we saw a mother wiping ice cream off the car seats and off the faces of the children. When the children are very small, the ice cream melts faster than they can eat. It begins to run down the side of the cone and onto their tiny hands and down into their sleeves. I saw a father once taking his child's entire hand into his mouth to clean it <laughs> and then doing the same as the other. Some children are good at handling cones and they know when to bite off at the end to create a hole at the bottom to suck down the ice cream. Cobbles love cones and they buy them for each other because eating ice cream is something very intimate which you need to do in company. Eating alone makes you look guilty which is what Johnny felt though he could not explain why. And that's possibly why people have children in the first place. So they can have a legitimate excuse for buying ice cream cones. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, a novel that I'm writing at the moment. Um, looking at this light and these flowers, uh, I thought they must have organized especially for me because it's a rather lurid piece. Uh, the narrator is remembering, uh, he's in his 60s, and he's remembering an affair that he had about 40 years before or more, about 50 years before, I suppose, uh, with the mother of his best friend, uh, who is about in her mid 30s. Uh, not very usual in those days. And it happens in a small town, uh, which is probably my fictionalized version of Wexford. I still go there more and more often. I can assure you this is not autobiographical. <laughs> she was struggling against the wind with her head down, the back wings of her umbrella snapping. And she would have passed me by, seeing nothing would be above the knees, had I not halted directly in her path. In the first moment she did not recognize me, and when she did, she seemed flustered and I thought she might sidestep me and hurry on. She had no hat, and her hair was sprinkled with glittering beads of melted sleet. Oh, she said with a faltering smile, look at you, you're frozen. I suppose I must have been shivering. She wore galoshes and a smoke-coloured transparent plastic coat buttoned all the way up. Her face was blotched from the cold, her chin raw and shiny, and her eyes were tearing. We stood there, buffeted by the wind, helpless in our different ways, and a foul gust came to us from the bacon factory out by the river. Beside us, the wet stone wall glistened and gave off a smell of mortar. I think she would have walked on had she not seen the desolation in my eyes. Come along, she said, and put a hand on my shoulder and turned about and marched me off in the direction when she had come. It was the week of the Easter holidays, and Mr. Gray had taken Billy and his sister to the service for the afternoon. I thought of them huddled on a wooden seat in the cold, with the smell of trodden grass coming up between their knees, and the tent flapping thunderously around them, and the band blaring and farting. And I felt superior and more grown up than not only Billy and his sister, but than their father too. I was in their home in the kitchen, sitting at a big square wooden table, drinking a mug of milky tea that Mrs. Gray had made for me, watchful and wary, it is true, but shuddered and warm and a quiver with expectancy. And uh, he asked some various questions about, uh, as I used to ask in those days, about did he... He first of all says that he, he uh, the priest asks him, 
as he committed uh, impure actions. As in, first of all, did he commit them with himself, which he finds baffling. And then, even more baffling, as in, did he commit them with his sister. Uh, by this stage, our, our confessing boy is in great state of, of, of alarm. Um, but eventually, he does say that he has been with uh, a grown up woman when the priest says to him, uh, Did you touch her on the leg? Uh, and he says, yes, he did touch her on the leg. And he says, did you touch her high up on the leg? And he says, yes, Father, very high up on the leg. <laughs> By now the priest has drawn himself very close to the grill, uh, as priests used to do in those days. Something exciting was happening. Uh, so he says that by now we were huddled almost in each other's arms, <laughs> whispered in sweaty comedy. Go on, my child. <laughs> I went on. Who knows what garbled version of the thing I tried to fob him off with. But eventually, after much delicate easing aside of fig leaves, he penetrated to the fact that the person with whom I was committing impure actions was a married woman. Did you put yourself inside her? he asked. I did, father, I answered. Be precise. It was she who had done the putting in since I was so excited and clumsy. But I judged that as people I could set aside. There followed a lengthy, heavy breathing silence, at the end of which Father Priest cleared his throat and huddled closer still. My son, he said warmly, his big head and three quarters profile filling the dim square of mesh. This is a grave sin. Both right, which? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. I think um, it, it, it's lucky for us writers in a lot of ways because we can escape, uh, we can sit down every day and live in this uh, very far away world, uh, which is not what the people usually can, you know, it's, it's far away from domestic things and from domestic pressures. Um, and I feel really blessed in doing so. Um, there's a great novel written by Colin Tobin uh, about that subject, it's called The Master. And it describes how far away the novelist is from human life. It, there's a great description of a, of a party that he has, this is Henry James, who's described in the book. He has this great party and he actually resents the people coming to his house. He'd actually prefer them to go and to be back with the characters that he's writing about. Why was the bed in the laundry? Why was what? The bed. I don't know. <laughs> to ask Mrs. Gray. <laughs> we make it up as we go, do <laughs> It's not, it wasn't there. It's not history. It wasn't there before we made it up.